Hello. We're going to talk about romantic literature of Britain and uh, the very famous novel Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. When we talk about any national literature, we, do forgive me, um, when we talk about any national literature, we always automatically mean that it is a part of a bigger context, um, literature of the whole world. Uh, literature of Great Britain defined the development of world literature during some of its periods. A lot of British writers had a huge impact on the writers of other countries, which shaped the world's literary process. The opposite is also true. World literature affects the British one as well. It can be seen already in the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, the father of English literature, who lived in the 14th century. All in all, because the British Isles are quite separated from the rest of the world, the deeper connections weren't made until travel became popular. British literature saw the biggest influence, however, after the uh, French Revolution of the end of the 18th century. It influenced the Romantics that went on to give shape and form to what we know now as modern literature. Here's how British literature developed through the ages. English authorial literature appears in England somewhere around the 14th century with the emergence of works by Langland and Chaucer. Before the time, literature of the British Isles was mainly written in French and Latin. Medieval time is also when British national character and self-identification starts to get formed, with one of its main features being irony that we see in Canterbury Tales, Jane Austen's work, Julian Barnes' work, and so on and so forth. In the 15th century, William Caxton brought printing to England, which also helped to popularize Middle English. During the Renaissance era, uh, the national character continues to develop. British writers start to pay attention to such stylistic tools as pun, wordplay, and metaphor that will later become more than just stylistic devices, but parts of philosophy. See Alice Smith's work, for example. Um, Victorian literature, the literature of the 19th century, is mainly novelistic. One of the main movements here is social realism and appear neo-romanticism, decadence, aestheticism, uh, with the further development of uh, modernism, postmodernism, and uh, various movements that are known, known as uh, postmodernism, metamodernism, and so on. Speaking about the Romantic movement, it did not just appear out of nowhere. Obviously, uh, you can see from the slide that it was um, sort of based upon uh, the eras of Enlightenment and Pre-Romanticism. Um, the ideas of Enlightenment weren't something that the Romantics felt very close to. The ideas of reason, progress, um, technology weren't really something that spoke to the Romantics at all. The age of pre-Romanticism that included, first of all, the Gothic novel, the novel that um, thought of irrational and subjective and mystical as something central, um, that served as one of the foundations for um, the Romantic literature. Um, and it is also based on something that we know as sentimentalism. This is something that we are going to be um, talking about now. Um, sentimentalism appeared in the second half of the 18th century in British literature. It was opposed to the no longer relevant philosophy of enlightenment, uh, which thought of the reason as something that was always the answer, something that was much craved by the Enlightenment and something that would provide harmony, clarity, progress. However, with the emergence of, uh, emergence of the revolutionary movement in France, uh, all of these ideals uh, fell through. And reason, according to the philosophers and intellectuals of the time, was no longer the answer. The much craved harmony, clarity, and progress uh, seemed to be now beyond human reach. 
these are no longer believed in. People are very skeptical about these um, ideas. Additionally, um, optimism of enlightenment now turned to um, sentimental melancholy and sadness. Although that melancholy often goes hand in hand with humor, irony, because let's not forget that's the British literature that we're talking about, uh, sentimentalism also lays foundation to the comic novel. This is what we'll see in the work of Lawrence Stern, um, the um, writer that we're going to talk about in a bit more detail later today. Uh, sentiments, feelings and emotions rule uh, the mind according to the sentimentalists, not the reason. What's morally right is defined by the feeling, not by mind, according to the philosopher David Hume. Consequently, what's morally right is subjective. There is no objective truth, no objective morale. Not I think, therefore I am, but I feel therefore I am, is the motto of uh, the end of the 19th, 18th century. Sentimental philosophy is based on sympathy and empathy. The reason is egoistic. The feeling is altruistic. It is important to share the feelings, open them up to, to other people. This will bring us as human beings closer to perfection. Subjective is central, according to sentimentalists, not the objective. Describing the inner world as well as the outer world, we don't just learn about the world around, but also about ourselves as humans. The sentimental character is contemplative, often reserved and inactive. Sentimentalism is one of the first steps to wall, towards self-reflection, turning inwards rather than outwards, turning to study the poets and generally human psychology. Romantics will inherit and enhance this trait. Sentimentalism doesn't cease to exist with the coming of romanticism, it rather brightens, deepens and enhances. Speaking of English sentimentalism, its main themes are the theme of nature and the theme of death, although authors don't stick to them exclusively. Natural landscape is seen as a reflection of the protagonist's emotions. It becomes actualized through the characters. Landscape becomes philosophical. Nature is also opposed to the growing industrial cityscapes. Sentimentalists defy and disagree with the ongoing process of urbanization. They consider the growth of towns crime against human nature, seeing urban areas as breeding ground for violence and greed. Sentimentalists prefer to live and stay in touch with uh, nature. Death is discussed by the motives and themes of deathlessness and, at the same time, inevitability of death that is seen as natural, not tragic. Stan's works are highly emotional. He was uh, one of the founders of the British sentimentalism. Uh, he dedicated himself to writing uh, when he was uh, 46 years old. Um, a lot of attention to his works was paid by modernists and postmodernists. He was uh, one of the first writers to ever use the technique of the stream of consciousness. Um, if we take a look at one of his works, uh, the 1768 novel, A Sentimental Journey Through France and Italy, we can see that the external circumstances are rather static uh, in this novel and are replaced by the very active, dynamic, ever-changing innermost feelings, thoughts, opinions and impressions as the centre of Stern's attention. There is no clear plot in A Sentimental Journey. The fabula is complex and multi-layered, but the structure of the novel is not devoid of its own logic. The novel um, remained incomplete. The main character of a sentimental journey sort of confesses to himself throughout the novel. He is not morally perfect, but he is searching for the truth that constitutes the core of human nature, and human nature isn't always just good. Human feelings are complex. They are good, there are good and bad intentions, higher and lower instincts that drive us towards our goals. 
Human is not perfect, and he doesn't need to be. There is room for evil, and there is room for good within his soul. It's their combination, the dialectics of human soul and psyche, that interests Stern. Uh, the main character travels, but it is not the geographical journey of uh, his that matters, but the emotional and intellectual one. However, his sincerity is sometimes questioned, a tool that postmodernists will later use and turn into an unreliable narrator technique. The circumstances around him are quite static, but his emotions overflow. His journey is a journey of spirit. He doesn't care that much about sightseeing, but he notices scrupulously his own emotional reactions to the world around. He laughs heartily at himself and some of the people he meets, which makes the genre of the novel close to a comical one. The narration in the novel is highly subjective, one of the themes of it being people's innermost feelings. It is more of a sketch, not a plot as we know it. The character's evolution is not important, one of the themes being uh, national character, for example, the French being more widely thinking but less rational than Italians, for example. Stern's sentimentalism had a profound influence on later writers, especially the ones of Romanticism, Modernism and Postmodernism. They considered Stern an experimentator, an expert in the slightest, most nuanced movements of human psyche. They would further develop the ideas and philosophy of Stern and also of Jane Austen to reach one of their own characteristic features, the tool of stream of consciousness, absolute faith in subjective, subjective sometimes turned inexplicable, incomprehensible and absurd. Speaking of romanticism itself, uh, it was an epoch in uh, some around 1789 up to 1830s in Britain and around Europe, a literary movement uh, that united different writers with common um, literary views, for example, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, Byron and Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley and so on. It was also a method, a unified system of aesthetic tools of creating literature and also a style, a form, in which literature was written. It started off with the disappointment in the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and fraternity were aspired for, but never achieved. A lot was damaged and lost instead. Freedom was the hardest loss. Hence the romantic conflicts between the real and ideal, the restraints and freedom. Another source of uh, romanticism in Britain, namely, was the process of industrialization that started in the second half of the 18th century and continued up to the Victorian era. Uh, the invention of steam engine in England, one of the developers of um, steam engine was James Watt. Uh, led to the appearance of railroads, which in its turn led to the bigger traveling opportunities and interaction between people, plus the ability to learn more about the world and new places. Hence, some of the romantic uh, themes, escapism and traveling to some exotic countries too, the East, the Americas, the plot becomes more dynamic, although it is now combined with deep psychologism. Evolutionary biology developed by Charles Darwin uh, brought the writers to get preoccupied with the character's inner dynamics, their evolution, them showing different sides of their personality to the readers. Non-Euclidean geometry by Gauss and Lobachevsky um, uh, turned um, towards seeing the space around us as not regular, like parallel lines, as we know, can actually intersect, or a triangle may have more than one right angle, according to the new type of geometry, which led to the writers and philosophers and intellectuals to think of the reality as distorted, complex and irregular. 
which led to the human inner world and um, outer world both being seen as complex and distorted up to the point of being fantastic. There are oppositions and discrepancies everywhere. The world is strange and often unpredictable in terms of its combination of things, phenomena and feelings that sometimes contradict each other. Uh, some of the philosophical principles of Romanticism are that human is the center of it all. Human is not a means, human is the aim and purpose. It is not that the feelings are the center of romantic attention, this is reserved um, to sentimentalists, but the subjective, innermost and humane. Beauty is not just around, it exists inside every human towards, um, um, in accordance with the romantic philosophy. Human, or the main romantic character, a romantic hero, is seen as a genius, someone outstanding, unlike anyone else. Hence, as I've said, the specific romantic hero, a revolutionary, who fights against the mundane, the ordinary. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he doesn't. He seeks freedom in different forms. The aesthetic categories do not exist separately. Tragic and comic, high and low, beautiful and ugly, true and false, they always coexist. Unlike the classicists, the romantic know and make use of those cohabiting contrasts. Hence the synthetic, uh, the synthesis of arts, for example, prose and poetry, visual arts and verbal arts, and so on. The Romantics were also very interested in the previous epochs, the Middle Ages, a faraway world that may have been perfect, hence the attention to folklore going back to the beginning of the nations. This is also uh, seen as a specific form of escapism, turning towards the previous ages. Uh, it also turned to Renaissance, where human was also the center of it all, his personality, individualism, seeing him as the prime example of nature's achievements were um, things that spoke to, roman to the romantics. And also, as I've said, uh, sentimentalism can be seen as one of the um, sources of romanticism with its subjectivity and um, radical internalization. As for one of the um, arguably most famous representatives of um, the Romantic Movement, here is Emily Bronte. Emily Jane Bronte, who comes from a famous literary family. Her sisters, Charlotte and Anne, are also prominent um, English writers. Emily had quite a difficult childhood. She lost her mother when she was still um, just a baby. Here is the house and the territory of the house where she grew up. You can see that on the one side of the house was a cemetery and on the other moors and bogs and just miles and miles and miles of desolation. Uh, her father, though he was a um, priest, he was, um, so the atmosphere in the Bronte house was very religious, rather strict um, and um, reserved. Um, Emily, though, grew to love the watery bogs and heather and the cold winds. She started writing at a very young age and left quite a lot of juvenilia, uh, meaning the earliest writings, uh, in her wake. Many critics now say that she was a very talented poetess, arguably the best one among her sisters. But what she is most famous for is probably her only novel, Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights has been uh, seen as one of the greatest love stories in the English language. But what it also is, is one of the most brutal revenge narratives. As a reader, you are as captivated as you are disturbed by the events, narrators, characters, and their sinful and passionate deeds. One of the main characters, Heathcliff, first may seem to be a traditional romantic hero, an outcast, sincere, true, lonely and driven. He is a foundling, 
taken in by a merciful rich man under his wing, then left out again with nothing but difficulties and struggles in the past, which he seems to you bravely, bravely overcome. But as we read on, we start idealizing him less and less. We see how mean and vengeful and selfish he is. This is Bronte's realism that goes along with her romanticism. With the given starting position as poor and unfortunate as Heathcliff's, what are the chances that the person could grow into a kind and compassionate human? The reader's attitudes to him, though, have been various, from attraction to extreme repugnance. Thus, the novel rejects the common Victorian notion that literature must be moral and teach what is right. Heathcliff's beloved Cathy is also far from the perfect female drawn by the previous generations of the Romantics. She is driven by love slash obsession. She is obstinate and egoistic. At times, she is just as loathsome as Heathcliff. Miraculously, the next generation of the Lintons and Shaws somehow avoids being molested by the desperate and angry Heathcliff, um, obsessed with the ghost of Catherine. So the novel doesn't just dwell in the dark, deathly passions, but gives the young and innocent their well-deserved hope. Wuthering Heights is a vastly experimental novel. First and foremost, what we notice is the romantic subjectivity, so typical of Byron and Shelley and Keats. But the right to this subjectivity is given to pretty much every character in the, in the novel. The text comprises several narrators with their own desires and hopes. Each character is also granted their own linguistic individuality. Dialogue is vivid with dialectism uh, and other speech peculiarities typical only of um, this or that particular character narrator. Characters don't exist in a vacuum that sometimes seems to surround some of the romantic heroes. They depend on the environment and their social connections, and some of them are sure those circumstances can be bended and broken if they wished so. Heathcliff and Cathy certainly take advantage of that. Uh, the novel possesses a rich and flexible style, one of its greatest achievements. The novel also comprises the seemingly supernatural elements, the things it inherited of the Gothic novel, um, that accompanied um, the type of uh, love and obsession Heathcliff and um, Catherine share. Uh, those mysticisms are not necessarily proven or debunked, um, as I've said, um, this is the heritage of the Gothic novel that influenced Romanticism a lot. So uh, this is um, the very romantic, but also rather realist novel uh, by Emily Bronte called Wuthering Heights. Thank you for your attention. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>